everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here with Nathan Zook, and we're in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, it's a very interesting time, because right now, uh, the March for Life was just this weekend. Uh, Capitol Building's right behind us here. You live here in the city. And something I've had a lot of questions about over the years is a consistent ethic of life. This is a phrase used by different scholars that would identify with different parts of um, the Anabaptist values. Can you just go into that a little, where, where if we want a consistent ethic of life, how does that apply? apply when it comes to capital punishment, the death penalty. The idea of the consistent ethic of life came about because um, there was strong opposition to abortion. Mm. And people, evangelical Christians, began speaking out against abortion, but mm -hmm. not so much against war or capital punishment. Okay. And so uh, Pope John Paul II, when he was alive in the 80s and 90s, really pushed the idea of being consistent across all um, forms of killing, opposing killing, mm -hmm. whether it's the government in war or the government in capital punishment or an individual mm -hmm. in abortion, mm -hmm. and saying if we're going to oppose abortion on the grounds that it is against human life, well, what about these other factors? Mm -hmm. Euthanasia would be another sure. example too. So my question then for you, you know, you're a pastor and as a conservative Anabaptist, um, how do you respond? To, to this teaching of a consistent ethic sure. of life. We ourselves are called to love our, love our neighbors, love our enemies, mm -hmm. that encompasses everybody. And so mm -hmm. we as Anabaptists, we as believers in Christ, or followers of Christ and His kingdom, we are not to take up arms. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not to say that God Himself is non-existent. Uh, there have been times where force and war have been condoned, if not ordered in the Bible. Mm -hmm. but. Um, we now have been called to love our neighbors and love our enemies. And so, on one hand, that means we will be consistently, as individuals, not committing these acts of killing. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the Bible does give governments, other kingdoms, leeway to carry out um, social justice and um, retribution for wrongdoing and so forth. Mm -hmm. But that is not our calling as people in Christ's kingdom. This is not something we individually could be involved in. Right, exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So how did the how did the early thinkers of Anabaptists, the people who would have started this uh, hundreds of years ago, how did they feel about capital punishment and did they address things like abortion? What what did they say? I'm not as familiar with the Anabaptist perspective on abortion, the early Anabaptist perspective mm -hmm. on abortion. I have read some about their uh, discussions on the capital punishment. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure how much abortion was a factor back then, you know, it still sure. would have taken place in some ways, but uh, not to the degree it has today. But Felix Motz, one of the charges against him, one of the, the first, considered the first Swiss Anabaptist martyr in uh, Zurich, Switzerland, one of the charges brought against him before he was executed was that he had opposed the government's use of capital punishment. Interesting. And uh, the other person who wrote extensively about this was Menno Simons. Mm -hmm. He mentioned that if a transgressor has repented of their sins and mm -hmm. confessed their sins and um, you know, apologized, then why would we kill somebody who has hmm. moved in that direction? The other thing, the flip side though, what if they have not apologized? What if they have not repented of their sins mm -hmm. as, let's say, a murderer? Then we're putting someone to death who no longer has a chance to repent of their sins mm -hmm. and cutting off their chance to confess their sins to God. So. Those are two very high-profile Anabaptists who, who yeah. took that stance. Of course, at the time they're, they're living, there's a lot of capital punishment being used mm -hmm. against Kingdom Christians and early Anabaptists. And so um, they're not talking as much. Uh, Felix Mossman and I have been talking as much about murderers, mm -hmm. but Menno Simons talked about in the context of the transgressor, somebody who was doing something that was wrong, not mm -hmm. just being a heretic or something. So. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because violence, execution, things like that would have been very common in that right. day. And right. especially even other church groups would right. have been doing that for them to, wow, that was bold yeah. for them to say that. But that hasn't necessarily followed through into all of modern Anabaptist mm -hmm. thought, but that was a, um, that was a stance taken during that, that time period. Was that, did, did that stance remain fairly consistent um, throughout Anabaptist history, or was that something more right at the beginning? I think, I think for some people that remained more consistent. Uh, for others, mm -hmm. it sort of became a, a pressure once you come to a country like the United States with separation of church and state. Um, still the idea that there was religious freedom. And acknowledging Romans 13 that talks about the, uh, the power of the sword that God mm -hmm. has ordained, you know, the ministers of the law 
to carry this out. And so these are not you know, church ministers, these are people in the uh, mm -hmm. in greater society. And so acknowledging that the government has that right has led some to then advocate in favor of the use of capital punishment. Where I would say just because the government has that right doesn't mean that we as the church vocally support mm, okay. it in that way. Just like we don't the, necessarily condemn it mm -hmm. or speak out against it perhaps, but we don't We know, can't really agree with it. Right? Yeah, 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 it's almost like war too. You know, that's right. something that's pretty clear in the book of Romans, you know, that's part of the government's job is to defend itself or what you know, that that whole thing. But we know as kingdom Christians that's not, not something we can be a part of. So it's not exactly. like we can get out there and cheer for something like that. Right. And the other thing to consider is that if you have um, if we believe it is wrong to kill, mm -hmm. if we believe we would be in sin, if we committed uh, you know, abortion, if we mm -hmm. were part of the machine that carries out capital punishment or part mm -hmm. of the war in the military, if that's sin for us, then it's sin for others as well. Yeah. And so we as followers of Christ's kingdom, we may not focus on the powers of this world mm -hmm. and their responsibilities and rights, but we do focus on the individual. Mm -hmm. So we as individuals call mm -hmm. other individuals to repentance. And so mm. that means there's no one left to staff the, to, mm. to put in the needle for lethal injection or to strap somebody down in the extra chair, all the better for mm. the kingdom of God because we now have people being called to repentance. And so yeah. if we knew an executioner, if we knew a soldier, if we knew a, a woman making a decision about abortion, mm. instead of pushing for political legislation, that's mm. not our business. Mm -hmm. But what we would do is call that individual to repentance. Mm -hmm. uh, in First Corinthians 5, it talks about the idea that um, what takes place in this world. We're not called to judge this world. We're called to judge matters mm -hmm. inside the church with other believers. Mm -hmm. um, but calling people to repentance is part of our great commission. So what scriptures might might be used for these views that you're expressing mm -hmm. here? Well, yeah, so the end of 1 Corinthians 5 emphasizes that we, as part of Christ's church, don't get involved in the things of this world, mm -hmm. making judgments. But on the other hand, you have... Christ's call to love our enemies mm -hmm. and to turn the other cheek. And so if someone, you know, attacks us or our family or abuses th their authority to, you know, execute somebody, mm -hmm. then we would want to forgive. And so, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so just, you know, the Sermon on the Mount basically is how we are to live, how we are called to live. If we are calling other people to that call as well mm -hmm. as individuals, not as governments, but as individuals, then that's our... That's a strong scriptural reference there. So then how do you, have you viewed the Anabaptist church? Uh, are they still holding to these values that the early Anabaptists would have had? Has been, there been some deviance from that? I definitely feel that Anabaptists today would be pretty, uh, conservative Anabaptists would be pretty uniform in their mm -hmm. idea that it would be wrong to engage in euthanasia, abortion, be part of the military, or mm -hmm. uh, capital punishment. Uh, where I, I do see some differences, people sometimes get so focused on government has this right um, that they almost come across as if they're cheerleaders for war or for mm. um, capital punishment. And just like we can't, we're not called to maybe oppose policies, we're also not called to support mm. those policies. That sounds kind of challenging, trying to navigate that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think part of the reason we wanted to do this episode is there is a lot of confusion. People are like, I don't know how to respond to these things. I think it's almost more difficult. What we are called to do is almost more difficult than than protest. I, I wow. spoke to a, a uh, pacifist book study in um, <laughs> okay. this was in Wisconsin a couple a number of years ago, mm -hmm. and they were talking about the war with uh, Iraq, mm -hmm. the U.S. involvement in Iraq, and they were really opposed to that. And they wanted me to give a non-resistant perspective. And so I said, now, have you talked to your nephews, your cousins, your sons, and so forth, your grandchildren who are joining the military mm -hmm. during the war on terror and so forth? Well, that was almost more difficult. That was a new thought for them. Hmm. They were focused on protesting, on protesting government structures mm -hmm. and policies. But to actually tell your nephew or your cousin, you know what? We're called to a different calling. It's hard to tell our friend and neighbor, no, mm. don't sign up for the military. You can, yeah. you can join our church yeah. instead. Do like John the Baptist and say, do violence to no man. Mm. I mean, John the Baptist doesn't tell the soldiers who talk to him, get out of the military. He doesn't say, mm -hmm. you know, Rome, is, mm -hmm. Rome is the evil empire. No, he says, do violence to no man. And so that's why I think it's a consistent yeah. Baptist perspective. We focus on the individual. 
calling them to repentance, calling them to holiness, um, without getting involved in the governments of this world. You've kind of already touched on this a little, but how would you say the current day in a Baptist church would view matters of life? I think uh, it depends where you are on the Anabaptist spectrum. Uh, <laughs> sure. There's there's very there's people who are very strongly uh, have sort of gotten indoctrinated into the, the political parties of this, mm -hmm. this country. And so you will find some who would view themselves more as pacifists than non-resistant. They'll focus a lot mm -hmm. more on war and capital mm -hmm. punishment. Not as much on abortion. Interesting. You'll get Republican uh, sympathizing Anabaptists who will focus a lot on abortion and not speak up so much about capital punishment or war. Both sides are shaping their agendas perhaps more mm -hmm. by political parties than by what is what do we call to do as scripture following Ooh, ouch. Uh, believers. And so as scripture following believers, we can take the stance that all of these are wrong mm -hmm. and we're not caught up in the Republican agenda or the Democratic agenda and saying so, we are going to take a stand mm -hmm. and say, this is my calling to follow Christ. And um, as part of his church, we call you to that as well. Yeah. And so I think there's been times where people who get so they get so focused on the next presidential election or mm -hmm. the next Supreme Court appointment, then it becomes easy to choose and prioritize. Well, this is more important than that. Yeah. When in reality, uh, we don't see that prioritization in Scripture. Mm -hmm. What we see mm -hmm. is that we are to love our neighbors, love our enemies, take mm -hmm. care of the vulnerable and the oppressed, whether that's the infant in the womb, uh, whether that's a prisoner on death row, whoever is being... Um, mm. You know, we're to visit people in prison. We, they, this is our calling as believers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think if we take that stance and remove ourselves from the political party agendas, then we will be more likely to um, to really be consistent. I think the world will respect that more. Um, they may not agree with us, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but a big sticking point for a secular society is to say, well, Christians are only speak out against abortion, therefore they're inconsistent, and therefore Christians are being hypocrites and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we as Anabaptists can be removed from that criticism mm -hmm. to some degree because mm -hmm. we ourselves will not participate in these activities. Does our opposition to abortion connect with capital punishment and how so? Like, where, where, how, how does that work and, and are Anabaptists making that connection well? I see them as being uh, the same on one hand and different on the other. On one hand okay. you have innocent babies in the womb who have not had a chance to be a transgressor. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have people in death row, many of whom may be transgressors. But uh, it is not our responsibility to decide when a human life ends. Mm -hmm. And that's where we can be consistent. Whether they are a transgressor or not, that's in, that's in God's determination. Mm -hmm. And we can determine in the church when somebody has done things wrong but outside the church, that's really in God's judgment. We definitely can look at actions and say these are wrong, these are sinful. Mm -hmm. But we definitely um, are called to love, mm -hmm. and there's no there's no restrictions on that. We're to love our enemies, love those mm -hmm. who, you know, pray for those who persecuted us. And so, if our persecutor is on death row, then we want to be pr mm -hmm. praying for him. Um, I, I had the chance in 2001 uh, to be outside the prison in Terre Haute, Indiana, where um, inside Timothy McVeigh, the um, Oklahoma City uh, Federal Building bomber, was being executed that night. Mm -hmm. And I saw people in protest on both sides, you know, strongly in favor of his execution, strongly opposed to his execution. Mm -hmm. And what struck me the most was uh, hearing about a man who had lost a child, uh, an adult child, in the, in the bombing. And he said, now I no longer have a chance to face the transgressor, face Timothy McVeigh, and forgive him, or hear mm. his apology. Wow. In contrast, John Paul II, uh, the previous pope, uh, when he was, there was an assassination attempt on his life in 1981, he went to the prison where the attempted uh, you know, assassin uh, was being held and forgave him hmm. face to face. And uh, people don't have that chance uh, once, once the death penalty is enacted. So even if the person is a transgressor, there's still, hmm. still the hope that somebody will seek reconciliation and, and, uh, and apologize to the family of their victims or to have a chance to be forgiven mm -hmm. by them. And I think that's, that's an important part to consider. Yes, they're not innocent like the baby, the person in the womb, but uh, it's still 
not our call to cause a life to, to cease. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a human life either right. way. Yeah. yeah. God will call them into his judgment seat someday. It's not our mm -hmm. turn to say, okay, now's, now's when you're going to enter that, enter his presence. Well, thank you so much thank for you. taking the time to be on this episode and sure. letting us come here to Washington, D.C. And, and do this interview. This, is, this has been really good. And Absolutely. blessings as you continue to pastor your church and study these things out. And yeah, I thank appreciate you. your time. Thank you.